Welcome to the Empowering Industry Podcast, a production from Empowering Pumps and Equipment as the voice of the pump and related equipment industry. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Empowering Industry Podcast. I'm your host, Charlie Matthews. And I am excited to be in the office on the mic with my amazing guest, Andrew Johnson, who I got to meet at Epic and I'm really excited to just learn a little bit more about you. So let's start there, Andrew, introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Charlie, for the uh, opportunity to share my story with your market and with your audience. So my name is Andrew Johnson. I'm part of a family business uh, I wouldn't call it an empire, but a uh, family business situation uh, based out of Kansas City. Uh, born and raised in the industrial distribution marketplace, and I now find myself operating a supply chain platform called ShelfAware. And our hope with ShelfAware is that we empower small to medium industrial distribution companies to be the best supplier they can be by leveraging RFID technology to run more efficient supply chains. And so that's Love what's it. led me to the pump industry. Yeah, so so many things there that I'm interested in. I um I, I during the pandemic, obviously, we all were talking su- supply chain, but mm-hmm. this is something that we have to learn and know and adapt and understand all the time. Yeah. And so um I'm interested in that, but I also just thought it was really neat like on your LinkedIn profile it said innovator. Mm-hmm. And so um innovator uh inventor and, mm-hmm. and so I was just curious do you think of yourself as an inventor? Yeah, I, I I wouldn't put it on my profile if I if I didn't see myself as an inventor prior to inventing shelfware, probably our most complex invention. We invented a, a smart counting scale, so we had some previous experience with um, hardware, integrating hardware and software to solve business problems. And then that eventually, those uh, smaller kind of inventions and led us to inventing Shelfware, which is a much more complex uh, system of software and hardware that that empowers these industrial suppliers to uh, run efficient supply chains. And so I didn't think uh, Inventor would be in my um, my title or my, my self-describing job description, but it uh, ended up there th- Thanks in in large part to my uh, my brothers, this unique family business scenario. I have, um, well, to be perfectly clear, I have three sisters. I'm the only boy. And I had an entrepreneurial father who started an industrial distribution company uh, a couple of years before I was born. So I was kind of born into this industrial distribution uh, world. We sell, the family business sells O-rings and seals and gaskets. That's how we intersect with the pump industry in, in that business model. And... Um, my three sisters, they're wonderful gals, but they have like zero interest in O-rings and seals and gaskets is not really that surprising. But their husbands, ironically, uh, they married through the years. My, my father's been accused of curating this group of guys, but he didn't. Fate just delivered us this team. Uh, my brother-in-laws, uh, I work with them, and it was really together uh, with the unique set of skills that fate brought us, uh, these guys and myself have come up with a really good team that helps us innovate our family business. And then out of our desire to become a more efficient industrial distributor, we invented these other systems. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mainly well, out of selfish well, ambition. Yeah. So family tradition, is that what you said? Yeah. Family, just this family solution, basically. Yeah. So I, I love it um, that everybody's working together and they are kind of your family coming together. And um, we were talking just this week on the podcast about um, culture and how, you know, we want our work environment to feel like a family. And so you've got that. Um, it comes with these challenges, I know, because we have sure. a family uh, working with us too here. But the the other thing is that they, we're all on a mission, you know, and we can talk about it and grow. And if you do have that entrepreneur spirit, then um, you are driven with that improvement and growth. So mm-hmm. tell us a little bit more about like supply chain and what is a sp- supply chain uh, innovator? What does that look like? Yeah, um, I think I'm an innovator in the supply chain world in a number of ways. First, my, my first experience in supply chain was really uh, traveling Internationally, um, I've been to Southeast Asia a, a lot, um, almost on a, well, sometimes several times a year. 
Um, and that's going way back, almost a decade. And I had a great education in overseas supply chain with this family business scenario, uh, importing a lot of rubber and plastic products from Southeast Asia. And so that gave me, has given me a lot of unique experiences to base my supply chain knowledge off of. And supply chain, I think is in a market scenario, we've gotten really, well, post-World War II, um, we got really used to stable overseas shipping supply chains, a stable dollar exchange rate. And for the last 50 years, we took advantage of all those market scenarios to outsource a large portion of our supply chain and almost a um, kind of a just in time scenario with China. And then because of demographics and because of cultural changes and the, really the US pulling out of being the world's police, a lot of these global dynamics have shifted uh, and created a lot of unstable environments in different regions of the world. And I don't see that really changing in the years to come. So the foreseeable future is going to involve a lot of changing. We've seen a lot of that since the pandemic, really, which just expedited everything that was already happening. And so it's a very dynamic time and uh, somewhat chaotic for a lot of companies. And it's inside that chaos that the innovators will find opportunities uh, for improvements and for value. And the, the companies that see this as an opportunity and less of a challenge and more of like a, a chance for them to to build a different business and a different business model. Those will be the ones that walk away from the next five years successful. Um, the folks that just, you know, kind of stick their head in the sand and just pray everything stays the same. It's, it's just not going to. And so they're going to suffer the consequences of their inaction. And um, so supply chain used to be a lot of different things. And now it's, it's quickly becoming a whole set of new constraints and a whole set of new challenges. And um, being an innovator is just seeing those challenges as opportunity. Yeah. And we talked to so many people about that. And I think the people that were already kind of looking at opportunities and growth, knowing, like you said, like this is coming, um, were successful in, you know, the hardest times for one. And, and then, you know, we're still adjusting. Uh, I was telling, well, I was recording something earlier and it was, it's basically like, I felt like it was going 90 miles an hour, you know, mm -hmm. from August to November. And, uh, and it was because there's so much activity. And so you have to adjust and adapt. And there are going to be times where, you know, you do have to kind of go all in and, and really focus on these areas. And this is one of those times, like, uh, where you had to figure out your supply chain, you had mm -hmm. to. And so, um, you know, I, I agree with you on that. As far as the people that were successful, were paying attention. They were looking for new opportunities and growth, not you know just waiting for somebody else to fix it or tell us what you know what is going to be the status quo moving forward. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm excited about that. I am uh, really interested in something though. I, I noticed uh, again, I was, I was stalking you a little bit um, on accounting. Uh, how do oh, you get yeah. from accounting into this? Industry. Well, that's, yeah, that's a great question. That's quite the leap to go from accounting to like where, where I'm at today. Uh, the simple answer is I had a, a, a father, a business owner father who, when I told him that I out of high school wanted to come work for him, I assumed I could just like, you know, I guess, I don't know, show up and become the vice president like day one as a, you know, 21 year old kid. And so my, my dad kind of uh, chuckled and said, look, if you want to come work for me, then uh, you have to go to college. And He's not, he's a big believer in the school of hard knocks. And so it wasn't as much about um, me going to college to get just any old degree. He sent me there and he said, I had two choices. If I wanted to work for him straight out of college, I had to get a degree in finance or accounting. And I don't know why I chose accounting. It's, I'm, I'm good at it uh, from a, like a book smart standpoint, but I'm not passionate about it. And so I did well through my accounting courses. And then when I came to work for my dad, the first two years was um, me being the accountant opening and closing the books for this um, growing family business. And so I have a theory that it's because that's what he needed help in, which oh, is why he was certainly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And he made that quite clear that that's the one from, for him personally, that's the one thing he wished he knew more about when he started the business was just the, you know, how to read a financial statement, how they even come together. Um, you know, what a general ledger looks like and um, how those transactions affect your bottom line. So I am happy that he forced me to do that. It, I, in the in the trenches, like at college, I wasn't necessarily happy. I was in the finance <laughs> accounting program. I, 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 wish... I graduated in finance, and uh, I feel your pain there. I don't yeah. know why they let me in there, but uh, yeah. uh, the details are important and important for what you're doing now too. 
Yeah, it is. And it's translated quite well. It's helped me run uh, a startup with Shelfware. We, we started it from scratch. And so uh, from day one, having that accounting background has been nice um, from a fundamentals standpoint. I understand better understand where the trajectory of Shelfware is going. It's a it's a different business model too. So that's been nice because I understood a little better about you know, how the cash was going to flow through. A, it's a software as a service. So we charge, we empower these industrial suppliers to operate on the Shelfware platform and then we equip them and charge them monthly uh, to run the service fee. Um, so it's a very different model than I grew up in product sales, it's two different worlds. So. so what are you, what problems are you really solving for your customers? What are you seeing? What, what does it look like? Um, and just talk to that for us. For yeah. It's going to be an oversimplification because it is a complex topic. And so just to speak in, in like briefly about it, We'll oversimplify it. Um, and I guess the simplest way to say it is the U.S. manufacturing industry um, has a real big problem with labor. And it takes a lot of labor to manage these complex component supply chains. And so if you're a pump manufacturer, and it's pretty easy to talk in terms of, of pumps because they are a perfect fit for this scenario, you to make a pump, um, most U.S. manufacturers don't make a lot of one particular pump because we've outsourced a lot of those high volume, simplistic pumps overseas. Some of that's changing. We'll see in the years to come. But for now, the last couple of years has been uh, a lot of high end manufacturing. So it means a lot of customization, uh, a lot of kind of small runs of uh, very, very specialized pumps, high cost of failure, high complexity, high engineering level. Uh, to, to, to build all of those pumps takes a lot of little widgets, whether that's O-rings and gaskets, uh, bearings, uh, fasteners, castings, machine metal components. And so the, the inbound supply chain to these pump manufacturers is so wildly complex and they really lack the labor and sophistication to manage that supply chain. And so through the last decade, We've watched a uh, growing demand in the industrial marketplace for help from manufacturers in that space. And so what they're doing is going back to their suppliers of these products, the O-rings and the fasteners and the, and the bearings and saying, not only do we want to buy the products from you, but we'd really prefer love if we could outsource the labor to manage those complex on-hand inventory supply chains. We need those parts. They have to be on our shelf. If I can't deliver pumps because I'm missing a 15 cent O-ring, you know, we're going to lose our minds. And so you can't let us run out of that 15 cent O-ring, Mr. O-ring supplier. So to facilitate that through the decades, companies, industrial suppliers have developed large networks of people and trucks, basically branch locations. And it's a service level that's really just a, um, they're moving the labor from the manufacturer to the supplier. So my uh, dad and my brothers and I were playing that game um, back in 2015 and 2012, 2010 and providing uh, the service level because it was required uh, by our manufacturing consumers, but we hated it because, I mean, it was just moving the labor requirement from manufacturer to supplier. The labor was no easier for us to find and no cheaper for us to employ. And so we felt like we could solve the inventory management piece by leveraging modern technology, even though we're operating in a really archaic space. And so what that meant was we used practical off the shelf technology that we could deploy in a manufacturing setting that could stand freely without any infrastructure required. And it would effectively monitor inventory, physical inventory quantities without us having to have people there to do it. And that was our original concept was how do we get our dude in the truck back in our office and out of the manufacturing facility yet still keep eyes on our customer's inventory. Mm -hmm. And so that was the birth of, of shelf aware, which is really, um, a very practical system using off the shelf technology with some custom software that allows us to spy on the component level inventory at our customer's location and then use that, that consumption information to drive replenishment and inventory stocking levels and doesn't require people being there. So I, I just have to uh, love the marketing behind the name and that you are actually aware of what's on, of what's your, on shelf. your shelf. Yeah. So your shelf aware. aware. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Uh, it's very, very great um, and needed technology. Um, again, you see the problem. How can we solve this? Here's an option. And uh, I love it. So I, I'm, I love 
that you were in it. Right. And you're like, this is the challenge that we are facing. So Mm -hmm. I know other people are facing it. And so let's create, let's be that uh, inventor innovator um, and get, you know, now it's just getting your message out there. So I'm hoping uh, that everybody will like, and share this so that our manufacturing, our manufacturing community can know that this has been created. So yeah, um, solution exists. Yeah. Solutions has been deployed a lot in the pump industry. Um, we have some great case studies for the pump industry specifically, and it's a great fit for what we're doing. Mm-hmm. And there's a great quote. It's uh, necessity is the mother of all invention. And that that's what, that's why we invented shell for is because we perceived a need. We felt the pain and we just wanted to come up with a, a solution that didn't require crazy amounts of labor. Yeah. Cause there, that's not, <laughs> that's not going to solve it because we don't have the people um, mm-hmm. and we don't. Ha- and, you know, I think that when we look at the future, um, this, uh, this is what we have to figure out how to use the technology with the people that we have. What, mm-hmm. what is, what is our, our assets, our most valuable assets, which is that human capital, you know, what, what should they be looking at? What should they be doing? And what can some other um, technology or asset, you know, fill in so that yeah. they can get back to work, right? Um, yeah, I think it's uh, it's tough because a lot of people, like, you know, they walk into a manufacturing facility and just, uh, when, when you think like technology solution is the solution, then everything becomes a really complex answer of how we're going to solve it with technology. And so um, I think for U.S. manufacturers to be successful, they need to think small for big innovation. They should look first for a series of small wins that they can string together into success. And um, some of those small victories in a manufacturing setting could just um, literally be like providing people with dual monitors in the front office and in engineering and even in production because we are more and more relying on you know systems and erp systems and software solutions yet we're not providing i walk through these factories and like people are operating on this tiny little screen and i was like man you just need two monitors at least maybe three in some of these scenarios and if we're gonna you know come up with all these key performance indicators and leverage analytics well then you have to get the entire production floor from the back dock door to the front office on board with this idea of key performance indicators. And so how do you do that without showing them the visuals and showing them the data? So, you know, simple steps like that, getting screens up in these production facilities, uh, getting a reliable wireless internet, um, having somebody on your staff that can run a a cat five cable or an ethernet cable seems stupid, but uh, it should be a requirement. And then um, looking really towards suppliers, they can bring a lot of solutions to the table or, or third parties in general can help manufacturers solve some of these complex uh, problems by just leaning on their existing partners. And so, you know, how do we collaborate further with the partners we already have um, through graceful applications of technology? So those are some of like the simple areas that U.S. manufacturers have to look to. Um, they have to be prepared to fail. Yeah. I, scared of that. You got to fail. <laughs> you got to be prepared to fail. Uh, such you do. I mean, you absolutely do. I was just, I'm still giggling about the monitors because I I could barely, you know, use my Google drive if I didn't have both of them. So like, it's so much help as far as speed and efficiency of what you're doing, being able to have those things open. It's just a simple thing that we overlook if we're not in it. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's not our job. So, um, being able to talk to your people and really listen to what their challenges are um, and talk to other leaders. You know, that was one of the main things at Epic. That was the point, right? Bringing those thought leaders together to talk about innovation and what could it look like and what is it that our industry needs. And um, one of the things that came up was training uh, and, you know, being able to give materials and resources in a form that people can consume, it may look different and it may, you know, you may need to change it because of who your audience is. And Mm -hmm. it's not always easy to do uh, for people that just don't get, that don't need it that way. Right. I learned it this way. This is what worked for me. So it's really just getting people to think differently. Right. Yeah. Yeah. A different way. I like to look at it through the eyes of my children and um, to try and get a, a look, glimpse into the future. You know, what is it going to look like 10 years from now? And my kids, um, they learn everything from YouTube. Mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. in Google. And so in our organization, it, it, we've kind of taken that to heart and, and shelf aware does a lot of its training and our future training plans revolve around our YouTube channel, making short format videos, whether it's a screen share or kind of um, us acting out a process on video to demonstrate how it's done. Uh, that's, that's the direction we're headed. We're just going to leverage the fact that everybody just Googles it and then watches right. a video on how to do everything in life. So we're just going to go with the flow and make a lot of short format videos. Um, and we'll make custom training videos for manufacturers to show their, their blue collar folks how easy it is to operate and interact with shelfware. And then we'll set that to like rock music and make it under 30 seconds. And that, that's your training video. And then you can distribute that YouTube link to 45 people in production and effectively train them all at once. And they can reference that link later, you know, for additional, I guess, refreshers on how the system works. And so that's, um, I don't think you have to overthink it. I think, I think we just have to put our training in formats that people want to use. In the same way, I would encourage manufacturers to leverage smartphones. Everybody loves their phone and we can't get off of it. And there's probably like a big problem at, at some of these manufacturing facilities is people just putting their phones away. But even when I'm in Southeast Asia, I'm blown away by these folks that, um, and I know you just, you just went to Africa on a, a trip to, and I've been, I'm going back to India in February and I'll be in Vietnam and in Thailand. Mm-hmm. And anywhere I go in these places, it doesn't matter what kind of um, finances these factory workers have, or maybe they live in a small tin hut. They have a phone, they have a nice That's Samsung right. smartphone. And that is mind blowing to me. And so just the ubiquitous nature of these smartphones, everybody loves them. They're in everybody's hands. The user interface that that is the phone is the most convenient thing to use. And so if manufacturers can find future ways to empower their employees to be more efficient by leveraging mobile apps, you can develop a mobile app for Android really cheaply. And that mobile app could could be something that helps your production employees capture data about the production floor or the workflow or quality control issues. Um, and the, the phone itself has a camera and it has, you know, it can scan barcodes, they can scan NFC, you know, near field communication chips, like your tap to pay features. You can leverage all that built into a customized phone app that also uh, talks to your MRP system, you know, through a direct database connection. So phone apps, mobile devices, these are all like graceful ways for for us to empower the employees that really just plays into their natural tendencies anyway. Um, and I would stay away from developing something on some janky, um, you know, industrial handheld that has its own operating system and a little keyboard, like forget that. You just want to use an iPhone or an Android. I, I love it. I love uh, thinking this way. I, lo- I mean, I could sit and have dinner with you and just talk all about digital and where the industry is going. It'd be so wonderful. Um, you're my jam. But I, I do want to just do a little quick rapid fire with you because I don't want people to miss the opportunity to learn a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, what is your favorite book? Oh, I don't actually read a lot. I consume most of my content these days via podcasts. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have a favorite podcast that you want to share? Yeah, I have a very eclectic podcast um, listening. So like everybody in the world, I do listen a little bit to select Joe Rogan podcasts. Mm-hmm. Um, I listen to some Lex Friedman. Um, and then there's uh, a guy named Scott Galloway who does a financial podcast, um, an investor's podcast. And I, I listen to quite a bit of what Scott Galloway says. Um, he's kind of an interesting character. So yeah, most of my consumption is via, via podcast and it's like, you know, traveling airplanes, trips like that. I'm sucking down all this content from curators on podcasts. I love a podcast too. Not just my own others. I I love Ed Milet. He's one of my favorites, um, to listen to. And then, uh, the leadership launch pad, my coach, Rob Kalvaroski and Susan Hudson, 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 Susan. Um, and then, um, what about music? Do you got, you like to jam like while you're, Oh yeah, I jam, uh, country music is my jam. So I like Morgan Wallen and uh, Chris Stapleton. And, um, and then when I'm not listening to country, sometimes I get into like a blues rift. And so I, I like to listen to some of the old blues music. What's the best advice you've ever received? Oh my gosh. Uh, I've received so much good advice. I don't, I don't, nothing like, 
I mean, I get told this all the time by my dad and, and by one of my, my business mentors, and that's to slow down. Um, mm -hmm. And that's just because of the way I'm, I'm wired uh, from an entrepreneurial perspective. I, I, I'm never satisfied with the speed. I would always like to move faster, but that's um, the advice that I've get given continually is to slow okay, down. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Let's shake it up a little bit. What is some advice you would give to someone coming into our industry? Oh man. Uh, and the same idea of slow down, it would be to just understand the pace of the environment we work in and appreciate that it might not move as fast as retail, but it's, it's got a lot of brighter future. It's more stable and it's where you want to be. There's more value, more fun to be had in the industrial landscape than there is in the retail landscape. But you do have to be cognizant of the fact that it it has its um, complexities that that make it so that we can't move as fast as everybody else. So Absolutely. yeah, take a deep breath. Take a Us deep breath. visionaries, we can't run off and leave everybody. We have to give them time to That's come. Right. And, and also the vision, we have to share it with everyone. So mm -hmm. that takes some time. Um, thank you so much, Andrew, again, uh, for being here. Uh, love the shelf aware. Congrats to you and your family for coming up with this and kind of integrating your businesses um, and what the work that you've done in industry. I absolutely love that. Um, Y'all, like I said, like, share, do all that great stuff. And until next time, be empowering. Yeah. Thank you, Charlie. Bye guys. Thanks.